Hello, and welcome to Global Scalpels, a podcast dedicated to the 5 billion people worldwide who lack access to safe and affordable surgery. I'm Rihanna. And I'm Taylor. And together with Global Scalpels. We're excited to welcome to our show someone from industry today, talking about some of the technologies that are going on in the global surgery sphere, which we're very excited about. Our guest today works with Nor Medical in the capacity as a CEO and oversees all the operational processes for the projects in Africa. He is an entrepreneur first, working on social impact enterprises during his time as a science educator in Philadelphia as part of the Teach for America Civil Service Program. He has consulted for various startups, aiding them with sales and marketing development strategies, and is an alum of the Climate KIC Graduate Entrepreneurship Program and was in the first cohort of the Baden Campus Accelerator in Germany. He holds degrees in psychology and in international agriculture from Pennsylvania State University and is certified in secondary science education by the University of Pennsylvania's Urban Education Graduate Program and completed a Master of Science in Environmental Governance at the University of Freiburg in Germany. So with that, we would like to welcome Andrew Bino. Thank you for having me here, Taylor. And hi, Rihanna. So you have quite an extensive background working in Africa, the U.S., and Germany, as we just read in your bio. Could you tell us a little bit more about your career prior to coming to Nor Medical and then what kind of sparked this passion for you to come working into the low- and middle-income countries? So while I was completing my bachelor's degree at Penn State, I had taken on this international agriculture minor. And as part of that, before I graduated, we traveled to Kenya, uh, to Nyeri, to a place called the uh, Children and Youth Empowerment Center. And part of this was with agriculture research, but it was also looking at youth-led enterprises and seeing entrepreneurship as a way, you know, as a development tool. And so while I was there, I was really just kind of blown away um, by the innovations that were happening, um, you know, much of them following this frugal innovation pathway that I'll, I'll probably speak about a bit later when it comes to what Nor Medical is doing. And and so that really struck me. But, you know, after graduating, I uh, moved to Philadelphia. I was part in the Teach for America program as a secondary science educator. And there, you know, I also worked with students on social entrepreneurship, community engagement, in that case, looking at climate change and its effects on Philadelphia um, and how students could kind of build a more sustainable city. As part of that research, uh, I kept reading about the city called Freiburg. In Germany. Now, Freiburg is considered one of the most sustainable cities from a policy perspective. They've been very progressive. And so when I was thinking about going back to graduate school to further my studies, you know, and I, I found out Freiburg had a university, it was you know, a no brainer for me. I wanted to gain more international experience. And so um, I moved over here, and that's where I've met the other co founders of, of Nor Medical. Nor Medical, for all viewers who haven't heard much about it, aims to solve the lack of sterilized medical equipment in Africa. Do you mind just telling us about how you met with the co-founders, who they are, and how you identified this need to begin with? Certainly. So three other co-founders um, and myself, we had all studied in the same master's program here, which is the, the uh, MSc in Environmental Governance. And that program really uh, puts a strong, I'd say, focus on international cooperation, uh, north-south relations and such. And um Three of the other co-founders had previously uh, previously founded a startup called One Life, and that was all about linking businesses in Germany to businesses operating in, let's say, low-resource contexts. Um, and so they had experience there, and, and I had experience working in other sustainability startups all over here. But where it really came together, we were meeting just to discuss kind of the business situation in Germany, getting a company set up here. You know, Germany can be a bureaucratic place, and starting a business e- even more so. So it helps when you meet with other entrepreneurs to discuss these things. Um, and uh, Saji Zaga, who's co-founder of Nor Medical, was talking about his recent time in Chad. And he had helped construct rural healthcare clinics with Adventist Health International. And it's really there that he came face to face with this issue. Um, you know, he, he saw how surgeries were just delayed because doctors there were not able to sterilize uh, the medical instruments. You know, so he, he was very passionate about this issue. And I think given the team's different experience in these settings, uh, we wanted to, to look into it further. And we really got propelled when we um, entered the whole prize competition, which I, I can speak about as well. You know, the whole prize really propelled us because, um, you know, this is the, the largest sort of student-led impact business accelerator uh, in the world. And their challenge that particular year was looking at energy as a way to, to change lives. 
And when it comes to sterilization issue, what we found quite early on is, is really it's, it's because of the lack of, of energy. The infrastructure is not there. A traditional autoclave device, which is a device to sterilize medical instruments, requires large amounts of electricity. And so it fit in with that challenge of that, of that student-led competition. And we applied and you know, we worked through, we pitched in Tunisia and, and got to the Global Accelerator, which is outside of London, met some incredible mentors, um, really started building partnerships with people operating in the field, went to the field ourselves. And, you know, that was the, the start of the Nor Medical journey. No, I think it's, it's just great to, to hear that you're thinking outside the box, thinking about other ways that you can attack some of these problems. And then also to be able to propel yourself forward with different types of initiatives that you are taking, taking part of as part of Norm Medical. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of the key challenges that you guys have faced in trying to satisfy this need of working in a low resource setting? Obviously, you're coming from a high income setting. So how are you identifying those needs as we already talked about when he saw it there? And then how did you actually mm -hmm. come to creating this this? Well, we'll talk about the actual item in a minute, but if you could tell us about sure. some, of the, the, some of the challenges that you got to, that'd be great. Something that's absolutely critical is forming partnerships on the ground. You know, there are people that live that reality day in and day out. They've seen what other solutions have come and gone, you know, and they have that, that intimate knowledge of the context that's really important when you come to designing some sort of technology to alleviate uh, a specific problem. So that was, you know, knowing that it's a challenge, kind of being disconnected in some ways. That's why you have to go in the field. That's why you have to form those partnerships. And that's one area that I think you know, Norm Medical has done quite a good, good job with is really building that network out, especially in the first year and a half, um, because that, that provided a really strong foundation for us to move forward. That's really great. And it's about keeping the people who are going to be using the product at the heart of the product that you've created. And I want to just like relieve the suspense. And if you don't mind just telling us exactly what you created, and if you could just walk through the steps that it took to turn this idea into a reality. Certainly, yeah. So what Norm Medical has developed is a hybrid uh, solar thermal autoclave, which we call the hybrid clave. It's a bit easier just to <laughs> call, it, call it that. Um, <laughs> I like that. So, I mean, I could give a bit of a background on autoclaves. I'm not sure, you know, this is a, a surgery podcast. I'm sure most people know, but, you know, it's interesting because the first steam sterilizer uh, autoclave was developed actually by a German, uh, Matthias Slautenschläger, um, in 1887. And so steam sterilization is, is nothing new necessarily. The methods of generating that steam, you know, have, have, have changed. And there's additional functionalities, of course. So when we were looking at how to tackle this issue, you know, there's all sorts of solutions. You know, some of them are, are extremely high tech. They may use a combination of different types of gases to, to destroy pathogens um, like nitrogen dioxide or something like this. Uh, there was a team in Switzerland that was creating a, a plasma. Uh, but this, this machine, I think, was something like 10,000 euros. So you can imagine it's not necessarily applicable to this context, right? Um, so for us, it was really looking at, okay, you know, steam sterilization, it's, it has a history of use. It's highly effective. The question is, how do you generate that steam in a location that may not have electricity or may lose electricity frequently? And then adding on to that, how can you do that in a cost-effective way? And so that was really the, the first starting point for us as a team to develop the solution. And you're right, this is a, a surgery podcast, but we do have people who are listening from lots of different backgrounds, business backgrounds or tech backgrounds. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit more about what an autoclave actually like is used for and all those kind of things, some of the more nitty gritty? Certainly, yeah. So an autoclave is, is a machine that's an important part of the overall sterilization process of medical instruments. So to make them clean and sterile for surgery so that you know, a surgeon isn't introducing any additional pathogens uh, during an operation, which then could lead to a post-surgical uh, infection. And this is a big problem in particular uh, in the developing world because um, you have about 1.5 billion people that don't have access to a medical clinic with a stable electricity supply. So they can't use a conventional autoclave device, which again, you know, uses large amounts of electricity. Um, and, and actually, you know, there's a, a Lancet Commission report, uh, I believe in 2015, um, that said that one out of three patients in the developing world suffer from postoperative infections. So it's a major problem. And, you know, being able to develop an autoclave to sterilize these instruments for that context, you know, that, that's our mission. That's what we're striving for. 
It's so cool that you guys came up with this idea after obviously seeing that there was a, an issue. So can you tell us a little bit more about the process of actually designing the autoclave and how you came about with the idea to do it with solar power and, and kind of just like the whole process of that would be really interesting for us all to learn about. One of the, the things is, of course, you have to look at what's already been done. So for us, you know, there had been teams that had used solar thermal uh, because it's very cost effective in many ways. Um, you know, there were teams from MIT uh, and others in Europe that had done prototype designs for something that could just use, you know, a solar thermal dish, which you're just collecting the sun's energy and focusing on a certain point, of course, to create those temperatures. And something quite important um, to mention is, you know, in autoclave, the minimum sterilization temperatures and pressures as required by the World Health Organization you need 121 Celsius and 1.1 bar of pressure. And so, you know, with a solar collecting dish, you can, you can do that. And our first designs actually incorporated that. A, a bit of serendipity, but we, we met an, a Ugandan engineer who was creating something like this uh, to create steam, to heat and, and, and clean things at his workshop outside of Kampala. Um, and so we worked with him and we produced a design that had a solar collecting dish. It all it used all local materials because one of the major things that we wanted to do in the beginning was have all this manufactured locally so that spare parts would be available and, and such. There were challenges there. I can get into that at some point as well. Um, but this first iteration of our product, you know, we realize is, okay, you could solve the technical challenge, but are users actually going to, to use this thing? Is it going to have the impact that you want? And, and the fact of the matter is you can't expect sterilization technicians to walk outside and adjust the solar collecting dish of this autoclave. It just doesn't fit in fit into their flow. And then if you want to automate that, you're adding more complexity, which means it could break easier. And then, you know, you're not actually solving the problem. So um, we went from solar thermal, you know, with lithium ion prices for batteries dropping so much, we were able to incorporate a battery pack back up and with a solar PV panel, you can charge it. And that's the trajectory that we're on right now. It's great. It sounds like it's something that's reliable that people can have. They're not worried about whether it will run out in the middle of you know, busy operating list. You touched very briefly on the challenges of making something like this is sustainable for the local communities. And actually, especially for someone like you, who's got a background in environmental sustainability and come all the way to Freiburg to explore that further. How did you make sure it was sustainable? And what were these challenges that you mentioned? There, there's different aspects of, of sustainability in that. Um, one of them, I think, is the aspect of um, once these devices are in a community, are they going to be continued to be used? Um, are they repairable? Is it something that is going to last? There's a huge problem of autoclaves that maybe are donated to rural healthcare clinics. They're just not designed for the context. You know, you may have some water impurities, they're going to break, they have sensitive electronics, and then there's no spare parts. So then you have this electronic waste, essentially. Um, and that's a shame. The other aspect of sustainability, I, I suppose, is just the, um, the energy requirements and the input for these devices. So, you know, we talked to some um, private healthcare clinic networks in Uganda, for instance, and uh, some of these clinic networks are spending upwards of, of $200 in diesel each month to power generators just for their autoclaves, you know, just to produce the electricity for these things. So then you're thinking, okay, um, you know, the operating costs in some cases, if they're not connected to the grid and they have to use generators, this is a whole other aspect of it. And so then if you have a device that, you know, solar PV is a bit more expensive up front, but if you can continue to run that device and you don't have those running costs, then it's even, you know, I'd get into financial sustainability really for the clinics as well, you know, for their operational, from an operational standpoint. And so how did you uh, better understand you were talking about the, some of the challenges at the beginning of, you know, it's, it's waste, it's this. So how, how are you able to identify those? And then how did you come to develop the current model that you're using to be able to address those because obviously if you're still using battery packs and things you could potentially create waste but you're saying you create less right so how did you guys go about that it's about having a design testing it getting user feedback and then also thinking about the life cycle of the device itself i mean to speak about another challenge you know um at one point we thought well couldn't we use just recycled battery packs you know, couldn't, can't you take other um, lithium ion cells? And you know, we do have a partner in, in Uganda. They're doing great work with this. They'll take old laptop batteries. They'll repurpose them. They'll create power banks. That's awesome. That's amazing. And, and for most use cases, that, that's fine. 
unfortunately for an autoclave, you know, with the energy requirements, you know, we, we, we ended up having to use new lithium ion cells. Hmm. But that doesn't mean that the end use of our device has to be, you know, way somewhere. Um, what we're formulating right now is a way that, you know, at the end of the life of this battery pack, which would be years, um, that it could then be sent back and repurposed by our partner into, let's say, power banks that then can be sold to people to use to charge their phones. So you have to think about the whole life cycle of a product and how do you close that loop. And especially when you're talking about um, a, a context like we're operating in, you don't want to leave anything to waste. So if you have that opportunity to, to close the loop, you, you have to take it. Absolutely. Um, and one thing you mentioned earlier um, was just about financial sustainability. And we've talked a lot about some of the issues with using donated equipment with its life cycle. But what is your sort of financial model and how do you market yourselves to your customers? Sure. So um, we're at the stage right now of conducting user interface testing, we're still going through that, that prototyping process. But based on what we know right now, what makes sense for us is perhaps a, uh, you know, um, a, a rental model of the device pay as you go. And we can actually do that using some of the uh, technologies um, like with M-Pesa and being able to pay and operate the device that can be integrated into the battery system as well. So then you, you, you lower the total upfront cost of the device. And um, that's something that we'd like to test and gain more feedback on. But that's, that's a promising model that we're looking at right now. Like instead of your Netflix subscription, you'd get your uh, autoclave subscription. Certainly, something something <laughs> like this, and you know the other thing is there's so many um, uh, let's say microfinancing partners as well that we could look at that you know even if it if it wasn't necessarily built into the device itself you know you could at least make the equipment more accessible for them at first. So you said you're trying to close this loop. So how do they currently get you the battery? Pa I mean, obviously, hopefully they haven't had to do this yet, but their point eventually in the future, if they need to return this battery pack, is that something that you guys are already uh, set up to do or is something that you're going to be doing in the future as things start to, the battery pack start to uh, over need to be returned? Certainly, yeah. Uh, we, we have a wonderful partner in Kampal, Uganda um, called Bodavirk. They're, they're a great research and development organization. They share this frugal innovation mindset. What they actually do is they uh, import lithium ion cells and they assemble battery packs themselves for the local market. And they are um, engaged in actually converting Boda Bodas, which are these motorcycles, to be e-Bodas and run on electricity. And so they already have the infrastructure in place actually to reprocess those battery packs and deal with them. Um, and so we're connected with them. We're utilizing those battery packs for a hyperclave device. And so the idea then is, um, you know, if, if you're in touch with these clinics at the end of the life of the battery, and, and, and one thing that's quite cool is that the battery pack is actually smart. And so you can monitor it and monitor its performance. And so from a remote standpoint, you know, then you can say, okay, what's the, let's say, battery health of these hyperclave devices at all these different clinics? And you can even see when they're being used. And then you can determine, okay, this, this battery pack needs to be sent back and then you can get, send another one. And that's all part of the cycle as well. And so obviously collaboration between um, you coming from a high income country you've talked about is important to better understand the context and how you're working to be able to better understand working in more collaboration with the low income partner, I guess you could say. So could you tell us how you've been working with your low income partners to, to not only prototype and develop this, but then also to use it and to do use cases and things like that? What has been really important, especially over the last year, are the partnerships that we have for these private healthcare clinic networks. Um, often they have very innovative business models as well, innovative training models, and you know, they're very open to, let's say, trying new, new methods or, or new equipment. And so it's been great to build relationships with them because we could send designs or we can have someone use our device and then we can gain feedback. And you can do it very quickly. And so that's really important when you're talking about, you know, iterating, you know, through your product development process. On the other hand, you know, the other side, I suppose, would be local, um, you know, government partners in some ways, ministries of health, understanding their issues, um, being able to get data that's been collected from these organizations, certainly other NGOs that are involved in the surgery space, um, 
we, we've been really fortunate to connect um, with a group called Global Health MedTech. These are all other companies that are operating on the ground there that are bringing in new medical equipment. And, you know, there's not that many in this group. I think it's around like, you know, 10 companies, but it's a challenging environment. And so to be able to leverage each other's knowledge and share experience is helpful to everyone. And so it's great to have that community aspect. Um, and, and that's, that's something that's been very impressive to me to see that. And it's interesting to see that so many different groups that are kind of working on the same thing are not competing, but instead collaborating to ensure that everyone succeeds in their projects. It would be very interesting to hear more a bit about the innovative process that you've experienced and also things that you've seen that have worked well in other companies that you've been collaborating with and how they can use these sort of processes to create a go-to market strategy for a product. Sure. So we've actually uh, developed a presentation that I think we're going to be um, giving with, with One Dot Surgery uh, on this, the, the frugal innovation process. But I could speak about, I suppose, two, two different well, say pathways. Uh, to innovation for this specific types of context. So one would be uh, resource constrained innovation. Um, and that's when you're really looking at low cost alternatives to existing, let's say Western products, um, redesigned and tailored for a local context. And then the other side is uh, the frugal innovation. And those are representing completely novel systems of products uh, specifically developed for a customer in, in resource constrained settings. And we've kind of leveraged both of these things in our setup. So for instance, you know, the smart battery system uh, is lower cost. It's built to be very robust, um, you know, and, and and so that's more of a resource constrained innovation. Whereas when you look at the the whole hyperclave system and what we've done um, to modify to be able to use multiple energy inputs, so it's not just um, you know you have solar PV charging a battery, you have the battery backup, you could even charge the battery with grid electricity if it's there, and then you have the backup if the electricity goes out. Um, but the, the pressure vessel where you actually insert surgical instruments that could be placed on uh, a cook stove or another thermal source of energy. And we have to make sure that those other components within that can withstand uh, those types of temperatures and these harsh conditions. So the, the power system is redeveloped and that's more of a, a frugal innovation, kind of redesigning the entire system and how those components work together. In both cases, I suppose that the key takeaway is you have to understand what I suppose that the the critical factors are in the environment that could affect the product. You know, in our case, it's the lack of electricity. It's the types of water that may be put into the device to create steam. Is that going to cause problems with some of the electrical components or the electric coil? Um, and then once you identify those things, then I think, you know, you could find solutions or you could uh, adapt things that maybe already exist in other places and just fit the context. So it's all about fitting that, that need with, you know, different, technology combinations, I suppose you could say. And how much time are you spending maybe in these these contexts, like you said, working around the what the constraints are of the local environment? Are you frequently going to, you know, you, you quoted a couple African countries or, or something, are you frequently going there and learning about the context or you're working directly with partners there to develop it who are on the ground? It's, it's a bit of a combination of this. It's a challenge, of course, being based in Germany and then go into the field, especially in you know, the time of the, this, this global health challenge that we're having now because we, we you know, we cannot travel. Um, and that's why it was important for us to form really strong partnerships on the ground so that we can keep moving forward even even from here. But we've been in the field. Um, we've conducted you know, hundreds of interviews with different stakeholders in the field to better understand this context and this problem. And, you know, I think though it may be challenging, let's say being somewhat distant from that, it allows us to leverage partners here as well. And so to give an example of that, you, know, you have Fraunhofer Institute. They're a huge research and development organization in Germany. And uh, we've worked with them to produce um, a steam jet pump. And this is basically a part of the device that will allow us to create vacuum conditions inside the hyperclave, which allows you to sterilize a wider range of instruments. Now, we were sort of a bridge for them to understand the context. And when we co-developed that, we had to explain to them, like, Okay, you know, you can make this very fancy, but we need something robust. We need something simple. These are the parameters. Um, and then, you know, even though they're based in Germany, they can develop something that we can then add into our device and test in the field in the context. Amazing. I'm still loving the name Hyperclave. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like it. See, for a long time, it was, it was a little tough for us because we'd get up on stage, if we were pitching this to someone or a partner, and we'd say, okay, we've developed a uh, hybrid solar thermoelectric autoclave. That's a mouthful. <laughs> too many. Yeah, yeah. 
it, it's too many words, so hyperclave it is. <laughs> <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. And you mentioned speaking to different people and, and giving pitches. Um, when With your company, how did you guys get seed funding? And for those of us who aren't too familiar with the process of funding something, what does seed funding equate to? I suppose what I would do is I'd make a differentiation between um, seed funding and then venture capital. So venture capital is more institutional investors, and then seed funding is something more from, let's say, an angel investor who may be an individual, but could also include crowdfunding. Now, as part of our journey in, in developing the company and, and being able to support uh, the product development, we fit into both of these camps. In the beginning, you know, we had crowdfunding campaigns, uh, individuals and, and kind of you know, angel investors that, that helped in the beginning. Um, and then we moved towards actually pitching towards uh, investor groups and being able to get the initial kind of capital to, to actually push things forward. Could you tell us a little bit more about this idea of frugal innovation? I'm very curious to just kind of hear a little bit more about the background and, and where you guys see you fitting into this bigger idea of frugal innovation. So frugal innovation, again, it's, it's you could say novel products and services that allow new applications specifically developed for a customer in, in resource constrained settings. So if you think about a graph, and you know, let's say you have, uh, on the y-axis you have quality, and on the x-axis you have cost. Okay, well, you, know, you may have cheap products that are of low quality. If you picture, let's say, the two variables of quality and cost, uh, frugal innovations are those that would be high quality for a specific context, but they would still be financially reasonable for them. So it's finding, let's say, the base necessity that's needed in a product to accomplish a certain function, you know, without adding in over, you know, too complex devices that may break down in the field there. You know, and that's opposed to, let's say, you could have very high quality devices that are very costly as well, and those are more experimental. And, you know, earlier I mentioned that there were autoclave devices developed that used, um, you know, a plasma developed through, let's say, you know, you had solar energy and you were developing a plasma that was then in a chamber to sterilize things. That's high tech. That's great. It technically works, but the thing is it, it, it's very expensive and it may only last a month in the field. Did I hear you say earlier that, that you, you can place yours on a stove so it can be like a, a pot essentially? Correct. So and, you're, and you know, many autoclaves, they, they're, they're sort of, um, in a way, they're pressure cookers, but they're pressure cookers that can withstand much higher temperatures and pressure. It's it's so interesting. It's it's cool to think about the different ways you can do this, right? Like I I don't I am just envisioning this in my mind. All the different things, just putting it on a stove or putting it outside with the sun or different things. It's it's cool how uh, robust it is, and and it can be altered to the different setting that it's being used in to, uh, to create the same desired effect, which is really cool. I mean, that was a major, you know, part of our development process was thinking, okay, what are the different energy inputs that may be available to people in these contexts? And, and how can we create one device that can utilize all of them? Now, of course, in the future, when we think about, you know, commercialization and offering the product, you may have different tiers because some clinics may not need to have the PV panels with the device. Many clinics actually already have solar arrays, um, which is fantastic, but they may just want the battery unit with the pressure vessel to be able to back it up and be able to run the autoclave if the, if the power goes out. Um, you know, so you think about different versions for different contexts as well. Fantastic. And I'm sure this is something that will definitely reverse innovated. So you're going to find that you have a lot of high income countries knocking on your door for this low cost, environmentally friendly hyperclave. Perhaps <laughs> we'll, we'll see. It's, you know, it's amazing because if you look at an autoclave device in a hospital, say in Germany, you know, some of them, you literally roll a cart of instruments into. They're massive. Wow. You know, but that's, of course, much different than having a small rural clinic, um, you know, in northern Uganda, where they may only have, let's say, a, a 20 liter autoclave and, you know, they do three sterilization cycles a day or something like this. But certainly, if there's a very rural <laughs> clinic somewhere uh, in, in Germany and they want a solar solution, we'll, we'll help them out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and you've given a lot of inspiration, a lot of ideas about how you went through this process, but. For people who have ideas they want to bring to this global surgery space, what advice would you give them in doing what you've done? Sure. So two major things that I think were really crucial for us um, that we've touched on a bit. And, and one is really considering the context 
and design. And as early as you can, getting that user feedback. Uh, I mean, you know, it, this is the whole idea of the lean startup and creating MVPs, you know, minimum viable products, testing them, getting feedback, and then iterating to the next, the next version. Um, the other aspect is the idea of partnerships. And I think that's so critical in this space because, as I said, there's a lot of teams in the past, they've developed certain solutions, but it never was clear if they actually brought it to the field. Because, you know, if you, if you have partners there um, that can help implement things and, and help you get that feedback, I, you just had a much higher uh, chance of success, really. And in opening doors for you and, and making those alliances uh, to really push something from a conceptual idea to an actual product that's going to be in a clinic and, and helping to, you know, change lives. I think that's really great. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about how you guys did that? So what was your MVP, your minimal viable product? And then how did you, you said you did a lot of interviews and things before. So how did you actually go through that iterative process of getting feedback, building the next one, um, and moving through these different stages that you just outlined? You know, before we actually had a product built, a lot of it was speaking to um, stakeholders that are really active in the space. And you know, just to, to, to name a few of the stakeholders really, you know, early 2018 that we spoke to, like Chipaigo, doing amazing work, um, you know, in low resource settings around the world and understanding what kind of sterilization equipment they were utilizing um, at some of their clinics. And part of it was leveraging relationships that already built from some of our previous work. So, you know, I'd mentioned that Saji Zaga had worked with Adventist Health International in Chad. And, and so speaking to them and you know, before you know it, then they can call five other clinic networks that then you can speak to and you sort of branch out and then you have this network of people that you can, you know, call on and ask. And part of that for us was, um, especially through the whole prize as well, is we had such a, an amazing mentor network that really helped push us forward and um, allowed us to secure some, some pretty amazing advisors. And so our advisory board in the beginning, you know, made up of people you know, not only in the, in the healthcare landscape, but also just business and startup development and, you know, really helping you take, again, that, that idea and the knowledge you have and, and then building something with it. To give you an idea, I, th I think, you know, it was, it was just crucial for us in the beginning, the, the networks and, and having those mentors. I bet. And I'm sure as many successes you had, though, I'm sure you've had many challenges along the way. Um, one thing that was quite interesting is that in 2018, you were invited to speak at the UN's Office for Partnership. And they mentioned your tenacity in the face of all of their rejections. Could you tell us a bit more about that experience of working with, with them and what drove you to persevere? Yeah, so we, so we were a global finalist, uh, United Nations finalist for the whole prize. And, and we went there and, and presented and uh, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, President Bill Clinton showed up and that was pretty amazing to, to see him. And, but it was interesting when they introduced us. I don't know if you saw the video. I mean, um, uh, Ahmed Ashkar is the, the, the head of the, the whole prize was just saying that, you know, through that six-week accelerator program, which was just incredibly intense, um, you know, week after week, they would tell us, like, you know, look, I kind of like what you're doing, but you're not thinking big enough, or, you know, you don't really have enough traction. Um, you know, we think maybe you could use more partnerships, or, and it, it was tough for us, because we were striving quite hard, and, you know, we're getting some good feedback, but it was just never enough, and so we really had to keep pushing. You know, we had to, to show, um, you know, I present letters of intent from clinic networks saying, you know, yes, this is a viable solution. This is something that, you know, we, we could need. There is a, you know, not only a need, but perhaps like a commercial opportunity to, to get those other business, you know, partners in line and say, okay, let's, let's push this forward. Let's actually build something. So, you know, challenging, but again, when, when you have people, you know, pushing you or, or, or saying, you know, ah, I'm not really sure on one side, and then you're talking to clinics and, and healthcare people and they're saying, you know, this, this would be great. We could really use this. You become incredibly driven to show everyone that, hey, this is something that, that can be built. It's possible. We could bring this forward. And um, so it's kind of bridging those two stakeholder groups, I think, as well. It's probably just such a fun experience to be there for six weeks, going through this iterative process and just learning and growing and I, I've never done anything that long, but I've done like, you know, hackathons or you go for a weekend and it's, it's amazing what that the growth and progress you see over that short amount of time, I'm sure is just a really, really uh, rewarding and, and great experience to be there with those people. It was 
super inspiring. A lot of incredible people there. A lot of uh, 14 hour days and incredible amounts of coffee. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we pulled through and you know, it was like running a, a marathon in some ways. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but that, but yeah, Bill Clinton there to root you on so you can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in addition to your mentors and the people that you guys have been talking about, I'm sure you've had to work with governments as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like working with some different governments uh, on the, some of these initiatives and what you've learned in that process? Sure, you know, there's um, quite a few coalitions that include governments, especially, you know, ministries of health, but also, uh, you know, different consortiums of private healthcare networks. So, you know, I'm thinking of, um, for instance, the the African Healthcare Network. Again, we had just an incredible stakeholder, uh, Dr. Tucker, who, you know, heard about our solution, heard what we were doing, invited us to present um, in in Ethiopia at their healthcare conference. and you get to those settings and then, you know, you are able to interact with people higher up that are looking at the whole, let's say, public health landscape in the different clinics. Um, and that was really important for us because it lets us understand, let's say, the, um, the situation on a country level that would be difficult for us as a, as a small company to determine. You know, we can conduct one-on-one interviews. We can work with these smaller private healthcare clinic networks. We can get feedback from them. But when you want to see something at the country level and see how many clinics there are that, let's say, are losing electricity on you know, every couple of days, that's when you need the help of, of those partners that have that data and have that view of the, of the whole landscape. Yeah, and having that bird's eye view to really understand the issues that, can, that could prevent scaling up of your product. Um, I know the product hasn't officially been released en masse just yet. Um, but do you anticipate any problems in scaling it up? And if so, how do you think you might overcome them? I, I, I mentioned in the beginning, we thought that this entire device would be manufactured locally. And that was part of our, our mission just to, let's say, empower the local economy as well, use local resources, uh, keep it more inclusive in a way. The fact is, is, you know, there are certain realities that you have to face as, let's say, a medical equipment manufacturer. Um, so there are certain components now of the hyperclave that we probably will have to manufacture abroad, um, import them, and then do the final assembly in, in Uganda, which would be, you know, where, where we'd like to launch first. Um, and, you know, so the, the scaling issue, I think you, you just have to look at what's possible, you know, locally where you're operating. Does it make sense, for instance, to, to really manufacture everything there, or are you going to have to leverage outside resources to accomplish that? Sounds like you have to use, it doesn't matter if you're in tech or in the operating theater itself, but global surgery just is one of those things that you have to adapt and be flexible in the tech space and in the startup world. You just have to be flexible. Things don't always go exactly as we think it's going to, but when you when you work around those things, you find new and, and potentially even better solutions than you might have had before. In hindsight, now that you've been doing this for a while, what advice would you have given to yourself when you first began working in global surgery and uh, with the autoclave? I think, you know, looking back, I wish we would have been ready to, let's say, adapt a little more quickly or pivot a bit more quickly when it came to product development. You know, we were pretty firm in our vision in the beginning. And, and you know, perhaps this, the, the previous question ties into this because we had this idea of let's do everything locally. Let's you know, hit all the the sustainable development goals. Let's, you know, empower people locally. Let's have the healthcare impact. Let's use renewable energies, you know, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I think we delayed certain decisions sometimes because we wanted to stick to that. And it's tough when you have a vision. In one sense, it's a, a guide for a company. It's a, you know, a guide for our vision or for our mission and what we wanted to accomplish. But at the same time, it needs to be updated, I, I think when there's certain realities on the ground um, and realities for the business as well to actually be able to, to develop something and be self-sustaining in the future. And so, yeah, something I wish I would have known a bit earlier is, that, you know, those are the hard lessons that you just have to accept. Absolutely. And it's okay to say, this isn't working. Let's try something new. Despite mm-hmm. that, I'm sure that countless hours and, you know, personal energy you've put into creating that up until that point. I'm just going to switch to a slightly different topic now. And this is something that is particularly relevant to myself. And I work in an environment where we love our single use disposable sterile products. And this is about your previous work in healthcare. 
about research of the environmental impact of hospitals. What problems have, did your research reveal? Sure. So, um, yeah, this, this was a really interesting opportunity for me because this coincided with the very beginnings of Norm Medical. So, of course, you're an early company. You're doing a lot of, of side projects as well to, to support yourself and build things. And um, part of my master's research originally was I did what's called a carbon accounting study of the university here. So that's looking at all the different, um, you know, the, the, the supply chain, the products that are being used, even things like transportation, and then, um, you know, quantifying, let's say, carbon emissions from that. And so the methodology that um, I developed for this was then employed uh, in a hospital context. And so it's the Kinder Clinic here in Freiburg. This is a, you know, the children's hospital here. And what we're doing is we're collecting data from them to understand what their potential environmental impact could be. And, you know, of course, when you, when you do a literature review of hospitals in the sustainability space, as you said, there's so many single use plastics, you know, there's so many different types of materials that just have to be disposed of, or, you know, let's say incinerated in some cases. And there is a massive environmental impact, even a lot of medical equipment itself just because there's a lot of high tech stuff going into these things these days. And so, yes, it's an issue. Um, in my research in particular, what we learned is it's actually hard to get data from hospitals. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, rules on like what sort of information we could get on say, the amount of money spent on, I don't know, let's say s certain types of medical supplies or something like this, because there's privacy concerns as well. Hmm. And so these types of things actually preclu precluded a, an analysis in some ways. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, the, the, the key takeaway is um, yeah, hospitals have a huge environmental footprint and there's a lot of work to be done there, I think, especially in the waste streams and, and what do you do with the plastic waste and, and so on. In those waste streams, what behaviors do you recommend we change to be able to actually improve that and, and advocate for more environmentally sustainable practices in some of these, as you said, more disposable things that we're using? One thing that is especially relevant when you're thinking about autoclaving and the sterilization of medical instruments. So, you know, there's a lot of, of, of single use small devices and, and even um, you know, one of our partners, which is a big uh, medical um, uh, surgical instrument manufacturer, they had even spoken to us and said, well, you know, okay, you, you could have the autoclave in low resource settings, but what if someone just developed a, a single use scalpel or something like this? You use it once, you pull it out of the pack, it's sterile, and then you throw it away. And this is, you know, an interesting thing for us because it's, it's like, okay, that, that could solve the problem. You don't have to have an autoclave to use this, but now you're just throwing this thing away and you're just creating another waste stream. So, um, you know, and, and the, there's a lot of cost, right? Over the long term, it's better just to have a scalpel that you can clean and reuse. Um, but I think that, fits into the conversation that needs to be had is, you know, if you, are there other materials that can just be reused and cleaned in a certain way rather than having them be single use? Just to play devil's advocate for a second, you know, there, they, I think there's this balance between disposable and then also reusable. And is it more expensive to just clean the thing that's reusable? Do you know what I mean? Is it more expensive and, or the detergents and the water and the different things that we use to clean those, is that more environmentally unfriendly than just disposing of things in a landfill? And so what, what do you say about that argument and, you know, how do you guys come overcome that, I guess? Well, you know, from what we've seen, if you have surgical instruments that, um, you know, are built well and they're maintained, they can last a very long time. Um, you know, whereas if you have, let's say a, a cheaper alternative, one, it may not be as high of quality, um, but it may fail much sooner. And then you just need to order another part. So um, I think it'd be difficult. You know, it's, it's one of those things. I was doing that research and then I kind of went full into Norm Medical. But, you know, it's interesting to me. I hope that there are more studies done looking specifically in the, in the hospital sphere and what can be done in terms of sustainability. Um, because, you know, in our case, in the previous study, even things looking at, you know, lighting and the... Um, let's say air conditioning of hospitals and things like that. And there's plenty of clinics in Germany, they just open windows. But in the United States, I feel like it, you know, it's just completely climate controlled and everything. Now, there's pros and cons to both methods, but um, I think it's a conversation worth having. And it's definitely something that I'm glad that you've opened this conversation about because it's really not something that seems to in intersect. Although people who have values of global surgery tend to share a lot of 
overlap and respect for you know other people and the places around us as people who are from the environmental movement but it just seems that those two just haven't intersected until something like this so thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today we'd like to just wrap up with our final five and these are the five questions we ask in honor of the five billion people worldwide who don't have access to safe surgery um our first question is what's the most recent book that you've read or television show you've watched so most recent book well i'm, I'm almost done with it but it's uh, skin in the game by nasim taleb and he's quite a big advocate of entrepreneurship and um, yeah, I highly recommend it. What's the general premise? Skin in the Game is, is really thinking about how having some personal risk in the outcome of something just kind of greatly increases your integrity and in making sure that, that that's going to be done correctly. Um, and in the sense of entrepreneurship, you know, there's a difference in some ways of um, studying something and, and just looking at it from afar and actually having to put a practical implementation of something to change the outcome, let's say in a, you know, in a healthcare context or something, if, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. No, that's great. Rihanna and I were smiling because not m most people who answer this question, they choose for the television show or something because a lot of us in medicine don't have time to read <laughs> outside <laughs> in our, in our yeah. other things are like, Oh, he reads a book. That's so great. <laughs> well, it could be last podcast you listened to as well. I mean, you know, <laughs> Podcasts are great for that because you can just be cooking and also listening and learning something. So I'm a big podcast fan myself. Us so. too. And that's why we're, I think part of the reason why we're doing this, hopefully people can learn a little bit more about the really cool new autoclaves and things that you guys are doing uh, while they're also doing some of the other things that are important to them and that they need to do. So our next question is what's something not very many people know about you or a unique talent that you have? Well, I suppose I'd have to, think about this from the perspective of people that know me professionally. Uh, so something you may not know is, you know, Germany is the, the land of, of techno and I do uh, DJ occasionally at, at, at various places. So, but to, to plug this into sustainability, we did something really cool last year. Um, there's a sustainability film festival here in Freiburg and uh, the, let's say the after social event for this, we powered all the speakers by bike. So we had, five riders on bikes with generators and that produced all the electricity we needed wow. to play the music. That's amazing. So that, was, that was quite exciting. <laughs> I hope you paid them well. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, you know, people get on a bike and they just start dancing. It's part of the experience. They just go. So, yeah. That's so cool. And um, what was your favorite toy growing up and why? I'd say Legos. Still probably my favorite toy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're never too old <laughs> yeah right yeah uh it's fine i was on the street here before walking past some store and there's actually like adult legos now and i mean and, and germans love legos too so and they're like super complex looking but they're very expensive so i don't have a set yet but you know I i'm looking <laughs> at them i mean you're playing with adult legos just autoclave legos right you're like you're just putting together a big <laughs> it's just the company blocks yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. So our, our fourth question uh, for the American in Germany is, what's your favorite food? Well, the, the American in Germany had an Italian grandmother, and she made the best <laughs> lasagna. So uh, I'll, I'll go with lasagna on that Touché. one. Yeah. <laughs> Very international of you. And <laughs> lastly, what was the best piece of advice you ever received? I had a, um, a really great mentor in my life when I was in my early 20s. Uh, he was someone that, he was a UN press correspondent, uh, a lot of international experience and um, yeah, really helped me with my studies, you know, through college and things like that. And, you know, something you said is when you're looking at, at global problems, you really need to build yourself an international network. It's, it's really crucial that you go and you connect with people because we're a global society now. And that's something that's really stuck with me. And I think it influenced my decisions to, you know, go to Germany, travel to Kenya uh, when I did and, you know, form the relationships that I have, which I'm, I'm really grateful for because, you know, Norm Medical is, uh, you know, was founded by four different people from four different countries, Palestine, the United States, Germany, and Colombia. We're an international team. And I think that's been instrumental to our success thus far. And it highlights some of the important things that we were talking about earlier with local partners, really getting to know the problem, working on the ground with, with people on these issues and, and just thinking really broadly and it opens up so many new, so many new doors. So 
Andrew, we're so grateful for you being on the show with us today. We really learned a lot. Things that came through for me that were super interesting was this idea of frugal innovation and learning how to, you know, get different types of innovation through different types of avenues, making sure that it's to the local context and having these local partners and then doing innovation, but still being environmentally friendly and thinking about new ways that we can approach the surgical operating theater and how we can bring about new ways to bring surgery to low resource settings is really great. And we're really grateful for all that you guys are doing in this space. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, Taylor and Rihanna. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, I think what you're doing as well is fantastic to bring a voice to, you know, a lot of people that are working in this space and to, to let other people know that, you know, there, these challenges exist. Uh, so it's so important for, for more people to come together and, and contribute towards solving them. So thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Global Scalpels. If you're interested in learning more about this topic or the speaker, visit us on the web at globalscalpels.com or any of our social media platforms. Please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and Stitcher to hear more great content on a wide range of topics within global surgery. If you or someone you know is doing something in global surgery you feel should be highlighted in Global Scalpels, we would love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us today and hope to see you on our next episode.